Today, we are continuing in Colossians with, um, we're going to start with chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And if you remember from um, what Pastor Jim has shared, Paul is in prison in Rome, and he's writing to churches he has not yet vi visited. He hasn't been there yet. But he knows of the people, and he cares deeply for the people. And he begins his letter with these words from chapter 1. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Isn't that a great way to start any conversation, any letter? I pray for you, and when I pray, I thank God for you, and I do it all the time. I care for you. You are important to me. Paul cares that they would have a true and complete understanding of Jesus Christ. Not a complete understanding of human speculation, of, of ideology, but of the full riches of complete understanding of Jesus. For when we come to know Jesus, we begin to grasp the reality of who we are in him. Who are we in him? We're forgiven. We're alive. We're chosen by God. We're holy and dearly loved. How good is that? Isn't that great? So chapter 2, Paul says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. And for those at Laodicea, who, and for all who have not met me personally. How do you feel when you hear that somebody who is distant from you, and, and it could be distant in geography, so, you know, somebody that, that is far away, or distant maybe in, in status, that, you know, maybe they are... Um, have a higher rank or more prestigious or well more well known than you are how do you feel when you hear someone like that someone maybe you don't even know and they're working hard to benefit you it's like oh my you know maybe maybe it's your boss's boss's boss you know yes you have a relationship with your boss but but many of us probably don't have a close relationship with our boss's boss's boss. What if you hear of that person's working hard for you? They're doing something for you. Or maybe it's an elected official. You know, the, the mayor or a state senator or the governor or, you know, somebody that's, that's distant is, is contending for you. Maybe it's a celebrity. I haven't ever had that happen, but maybe a celebrity's heard about your cause and, and wants to take it up. They, they, they think, this is, this is something I want to be part of. Well, that's kind of how it was for the people at Colossae and Laodicea to have Paul, whom they have never met, but who is a well-known follower of Jesus Christ, to say, I am contending hard for you. You know, you, I, I never sat down and shared a meal with you, but I'm working hard for you because I care about you. It's humbling, isn't it? And it also tends to spur us on a bit. If I heard, if I was, if I was in the church at Colossae and I heard the Apostle Paul, this great man, is contending hard for me, I think I'm going to contend for myself a little bit, too. I mean, you know, I'm not going to slack off. But what was, for what was Paul contending? Verse 2, he says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul was contending for them. He was striving for them. He was working hard, not so that they would succeed financially, 
or socially or politically, not that they might make a great name for themselves, that they might gain power or prestige. He was not only contending for them that they could enjoy a comfortable, fulfilled, stress-free life. That wasn't his purpose. He was contending for them, striving for them, working hard for them, that they, that we may be encouraged in heart and united in love. So what does that mean? Encouraged in heart. Encouraged means to call to one side. I love this picture. Call to one side, to comfort, to strengthen. It's engulfed in arms. We have our arms around each other. We're in this together. If, you know, if that person in the middle with the green shirt should trip, the two on the other side are going to hold him up, aren't they? <laughs> Barb says no, but <laughs> hopefully we will. We're, we're side by side, heart to heart, in this together. That's what encourage means. Paul desires that they be united in love. And that means the kind of love that is actively seeking the good of another. You know, private devotions, our, our personal Bible study, our quiet time alone with God, these things are good and these things are important and we need them in our lives. But over and over and over again, we see so very clearly in Scripture that we are to live life, this, this life where Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. We are to live this Jesus life together with each other. The verse I read said united in love. The King James verse, Version says knit together, knitted together in love. So I brought some Knitting, because <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> In knitting, each stitch relies on all the others around it to hold it into place, to give it its shape and its purpose. Each stitch is important for the stitch next to it. An issue with one stitch affects all the others around it. You see, there's an issue with one stitch. There's a hole. But if you look really carefully to the, to the right of the stitch, see how the others are kind of bunched up a little bit? They're affected too. The problem is with one particular stitch, but it affects those around it. We need each other, and we affect one another when there's a problem. Let's see here. One or two isolated stitches, like this, this little bobble right here. If I can. Here. Illustrations work better when. Now, I was going to do this really, oh, there. So. One or two isolated stitches aren't very productive or effective and are easily pulled apart. But these stitches here, you can pull on them, you can stretch them. They're connected, they stay together, they support one another. I need you in order to experience the full riches of complete understanding of who God is. I need you in order to understand who he has called me to be. I need you in order to truly understand how to know God, to love God, how to follow Jesus. I need you. And you need me to know and to love and to follow Jesus as well. We need each other. 
Our life in God cannot be lived in spiritual isolation. God never intended for it to be like that. Instead, we are designed to live side by side, intertwined. Why? So that we can know the mystery of God. Last Sunday, Jim showed you his library card. Well, this is my library card. And <laughs> I didn't even realize it. It's on top of some knitting. So this is my library card. I actually use my library card. With it, I have borrowed hundreds of books, literally hundreds of books. And if you take a quick peek at my um, reading list, you will see that my favorite genre of, of fiction is mystery. I love to read mysteries. I love a good mystery, that, that dilemma, the not knowing, the waiting as the plot unfolds, the watching the pieces come together. Now, I want to see a show of hands. I know some people, when they're starting to read a, a mystery, they like to skip to the very last and see who done it ahead of time. Is there anybody in here that does that? Good for you, because I do not, and you should not read mysteries that way. <laughs> but there are people who do. So I don't try to figure out who done it ahead of time, because I thoroughly enjoy the process of letting the whole thing work itself out until the very end. Although it is kind of fun when, when the culprit is revealed and you go, I knew it, I knew it, I figured it out. But the point is, is to let the process work itself out and to enjoy it. Well, dictionary.com defines mystery as anything that is kept secret or remains unexplained or unknown. But for Paul... The mystery of God is the grand secret, that magnificent wonder, and we have been given the password. We've been given the key that unlocks the mystery. It's not unknowable. Instead of knowledge withheld, the mystery of God is truth revealed. Um, last week, in, when Jim was um, talking about the last part of chapter 1 of Colossians, he read this verse. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. So God's chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This mystery revealed to us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is the heart of God's secret plan. He is the treasure that we find when we, when we solve the mystery. By the way, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that you here, as in most of the times Paul uses the word you in his letters, is plural. So it's not, you know, you Tessa, or you Narita, or you Jonathan. It's y'all, all of us. Paul writes... Here, my goal, my purpose is that you, y'all, will be so connected with one another in the love of God that you will together participate in the wonder and glory of Jesus in you and you in him. The mystery of God, Christ in us a life of hope and exceeding abundance over and above, more than enough, no matter, no matter what our current circumstance may look like. 
Well, back to chapter 2, verse 4. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Are you easily deceived? I admit, I tend to be a little on the gullible side. Yep. Diane, you and me. <laughs> so, but he says, I tell you this, I tell you who you are. I tell you that the mystery has been revealed so that no one will deceive you with fine-sounding arguments. When we believe and practice the truth of God's reality, nothing, not the struggles of everyday life, not, not the difficulties and traumas that, that Paul calls these light afflictions, not scientists and politicians and self-proclaimed prophets and experts, none of these things can shake our confidence in who God is and who we are in him. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul says, I can't be with you right now physically. I can't sit down and share a meal. I can't, can't have a discussion with you. But I'm present with you in spirit. And I am so glad that you're holding firm. Keep doing it. Stand firm. Hold on. Keep encouraging each other. Live up to the good that people can see in you. Do you hear that? Live up to the good that people can see in you. Not because it's you that they see, because what they're seeing is Christ in you. So live up to that. Together, let's live up to Christ in us. By the way, this, this plural you is, is not just those of us in this room or the hundred or so people that call Caldwell Free Methodist Church their church home. Just as we should not be isolated as individual Christians, neither should we isolate as individual congregations. And I have to tell you, one of the most encouraging experiences I had this whole week, the, probably the, one of the best things that happened to me, um, we have a pastor's prayer group that meets on Tuesday mornings. And there's usually, I don't know, six, eight, sometimes ten of us. Um, but we meet together and have coffee and share with one another and pray together. And... Um, this last Tuesday, one of our friends, Dave, who is the pastor at Christ Community Church here in Caldwell, he, um, his mom had passed away um, a week or two ago, and he's been gone and been, not been with us for several weeks while he was taking care of his mom and dad. And he was back last Sunday was his first Sunday back in his congregation. And he said, I have to tell you, one of the things that we did while I was back for my first Sunday back, is we prayed for each one of your churches. My pastor friends, my church prayed for your church last Sunday. <sighs> that was so cool. Christ Community Church is praying for us. We are part of them and they are part of us. We are one in Jesus. We are united in him because of who he is and what he has done for us. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. So then, Paul says, we've been talking about who you are. 
You are united with Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is who you are. So then, this is how we are to live out who we are. This is who we are. This is how we are to live that out. Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, I look around the room and I pray hopefully that every single one of us has received Christ Jesus as Lord. And if you haven't, there's a lot of Christians around in this place. Talk to one of us. We'll help you will explain who Jesus is and what he did and how you can be part of him. Just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. Received means to take to oneself. Imagine that person that you love most in the world and now imagine that you have been reunited with that person after a long separation. What do you do? Hug, okay, hug. See, isn't that a great picture? I adore that picture. That's receiving someone to yourself. That's receiving someone to yourself. You hug and you don't let go. You keep near. Are we obsessed with Jesus? We have received him as Lord. Are we obsessed with him, staying as close to him as we can possibly get, not letting go? So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Salvation, receiving Jesus, is not a one and done It is not pray the prayer and collect your get out of hell free card. He is now our life. When you talk about someone is my life, that means that that you are so captivated with that person that 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 everything you do and everything you think and everything you say is just embraced by the love of that person he is our life he is our lord he is our master continue to live your lives in him means that what he wants is more important than what i want Continue to live your lives in him means that we follow him to learn from him how to be like him. It means setting aside anything and everything that does not honor him. Jesus told us to abide in me. Abide in me doesn't mean 24-7 private prayer and Bible study. You know, it doesn't mean that we just kind of have this Me and Jesus, little holy huddle, and isolate ourselves that way. Abide in me does mean that every thought, every word, every purchase, every post, every joke that we laugh at, every story that we tell, Every game that we play, every book that we read, every relationship, every conversation, every tax return, every meal shared with a friend, every meal shared with a stranger, every prayer prayed, every chore completed, every pleasure enjoyed, every bag of popcorn or cool cup of water that we share, all 
is done with the full awareness of the presence of Christ with us and in us. Every breath I take, every word I say, every bite of food that goes into my mouth, every cuddle with a weak old baby, every smile at her little face, is done in the full awareness of the presence of Jesus Christ. In the next chapter of, of Colossians, Paul will write in verse 17, he'll say, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever we do. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. Rooted him in him is, is established and nourished like a, like a tree in good soil. Built up in him, like a solid house going up brick by brick on a foundation, on the foundation of who God is. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Our confidence in God, our confidence in his promises, our confidence in his faithfulness, these things are, are certain and secure. He is the I am the beginning and the end, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His love endures forever and his mercies never fail. Paul says, you know this. This is your confidence. This is the faith you were taught. Now continue to be established more and more firmly in that faith. You already know it now more and more. More and more. Explore his truth. Delve deep into his reality. Never stop learning about him. Never stop talking about him. But we have to be careful neither to be too easily persuaded. And again, this is where some of that together comes into play. Because we're to, to bounce our ideas about God off of each other. You know, I love our ladies Sunday morning Bible study. And I know the men have a great one too. And because part of what we do is we talk about God. And it's not a lecture it's all of us sharing our ideas and our thoughts and our questions together. Discuss God. Discuss your ideas about him. Dissect them. Compare them with the truth that we already know. And as we do this, as we explore and discuss together, our faith will continue to grow stronger. So then, just as you have already received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, thankfulness toward God is not a casual afterthought. It's something that, that's kind of thrown in at the end because it sounds good. Overflowing with thankfulness. It's spilling out, pouring over, getting everything else around us soaking wet. The Greek word for thankfulness is eucharistia. It's a great word. In fact, let's all say it together. Eucharistia. Okay, we'll say one, two, three. Eucharistia. It's a wonderful word to, to know. And it means active gratitude. I can be thankful in my heart, sort of, and it doesn't really show, and it doesn't really play out in how I live in my life. 
But overflowing with thankfulness is active gratitude. It makes a difference in how I live. Eucharistia also has close linguistic ties to the words for grace and for joy. Gratitude, joy, grace, overflowing, overflowing as we live our life together. The Kingdom New Testament has these verses this way. So then, again, this is who you are. You are in Christ, the mystery of God, the hope of glory. So then, just as you receive King Jesus as Lord, you must continue your journey in him. You must put down healthy roots in him, being built up brick by brick in him and established strongly in the faith, just as you were taught, with overflowing thankfulness. So I ask us today, how do we continue to live our life in Jesus? What does it look like for us to together reflect his character? To depend on him for flourishing and for stability? to grow in our faith, and to gush with active gratitude. What does it look like? And that's not just a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'm going to actually ask us, what does it look like for us to live this life of Jesus together? Do not give up meeting together. And we're here today, aren't we? And I am thankful. What else does it look like? Acceptance of each other. Praying for each other. Serving one another, okay? How? Okay, somebody needs help moving, or if somebody, you know, if you know somebody's having a hard day. Texting is so easy. It takes 30 seconds to send somebody a text saying, I'm thinking about you today. I thank God for you today. I'm praying for you. May your day be blessed. And yet, you know how... You, I hope you know how encouraging it is to receive something like that. I hope you've received words like that. We're in this together. That, you know, I know you're having a tough time today. I smile when I think about you. Or, here's a plate of cookies. <laughs> I have a friend who's done that for me a time or two. <laughs> Or, can I just come over and sit with you and just be there with you? There's just, there's so many ways. Or, God shared this truth about himself with me today. I want to share it with you. How will we spur one another on in this connected life God has called us to live? I need you. Bunches. <laughs> and you need me. And you need the person that's sitting next to you and the person that's sitting three rows away from you. And we don't just need each other on Sunday mornings. Eucharistia. I hope this word sounds just a little bit familiar because it's where we get the word Eucharist, which is also called communion, the Lord's Supper. It's where we come together and we share 
bread from a common loaf and juice from a <laughs> common Welch's jar. <laughs> and the bread is to remind us of the blood that Jesus shed for us. And the bread is to remind us of his body that was broken for us. And as we eat it and as we drink it, it unites us, not only with him, but with each other. So I just want to share again, communion is anybody is welcome to partake in communion who wants to take that one step closer to God. If that's your heart, you are welcome to come. But as you come, remember, we are being united with him and we are being united with one another. We're going to, as we, um, before we come to take communion, we're going to sing the doxology together. So would everybody please stand and Marcy's going to lead us in that. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. 